Though I didn't know Michael, I know a lot of my comrades out here from the Sacramento chapter knew him and organized with them. Out uh, here, you know, we have representatives from Islos, Long Beach, Fresno. Uh, and we're here in solidarity. What Michael showed for the courage to struggle was solidarity. That's what we aim to push for. We are not here to continue the division, you know. Michael showed us something that was something that was there. Solidarity. Didn't matter where your struggle was. Didn't matter what skin color you were, what religion you were. You fought for what you believed was right. If it was for the workers' struggle, you fought for that. If you believed in the end to the, in the, end to the mass incarceration, you fought for that. If you believed in the end to the deportations, you fought for that. Michael fought for solidarity. Michael was that shining path. What I've heard right now is he would be the first ones, the first one in the picket line, the first one to stand up. And this is what we're here for. You know, from my son to Kurdistan, our struggle is one. And we have to remember that. And we are here in solidarity. Um, Okada once said, and I hate to uh, bring out my phone to do this, but uh, <clears throat> I did not choose war. War is what I hate the most on earth. But when the slave system is forced upon you, I had to choose war to resist the system and become free. The more I fought, the freer I got. And that became life. And this is what he did. He fought. He, he had, in, home, in the home front, he fought uh, as an organizer in Rashaba, he fought as a freedom fighter. That's what he is. He was a freedom fighter. The Turkish government have, has painted the comrades that fight with the YPG, PKK, and other organizations as terrorists. No, they are not terrorists. They are freedom fighters. They are fighting the Dilash, which is ISIS, uh, you know, that is imprisoning women. The YPG struggle we look at as a struggle that liberates the mujeres, the women first. You know, and it takes a lot to say, I am going to dedicate my life at that young age and go forward and go to a foreign nation and fight, you know, without no pay, with solidarity and heart. Um, you know, I, like I said, I don't claim to know him. I know my comrades in Sacramento did, and it's an honor to be here, you know, an honor to be among his comrades, friends, and families, to pay our respects to a comrade that did the sacrifice, you know, and ask ourselves, will we be willing to do that? It's a hard question. It's a very hard question to ask ourselves, to leave your family, your friends behind, to leave everything you love and go miles away for a country that you have no ties to and to fight for, but no, Michael did that. Michael fought for a country that was not his, a country that doesn't even exist, let's be honest. Kurdistan does not exist and it's not recognized. Just like many of us are not recognized as indigenous folks, as, you know, Asla and Anawa, Turtle Island, you know, the Black Liberation Belt, it's not recognized. But we recognize it in our hearts and that's what Michael did. He recognized Kurdistan, he recognized the revolution that is going to be in our hearts and minds. Thank you. All power to the people. Um, next, we're going to hear from Shelly, uh, one of Michael's close friends and uh, comrade who served on the DSAE board with Mike. try and treat this like an old school DSA meeting where we had like five or six people. Um, Jen and Mike Sr., of course, it's always nice to see you. Um, this is going to be difficult for me, so bear with me. There are people that we will meet in our lives who perform and command our absolute and complete love because they remind you of the remarkable things that we can do for each other and how we depend on one another. Mike is one of these people. He loved his community and the people he worked for to a fault in a way that was impossible to ignore. Several years ago, when Mike and I became close friends, we would spend long, mosquito-bitten, fire-warmed evenings together in the backyard. I'd always get a call late at night. Mike's over, come hang out. We were all in a little love with Mike, of course. We all wanted to be a little bit cooler, a little bit wiser, a little slower around him, like he was with us even though he never cared about any of that, because he was fantastically humble. So fine, of course, I'll get myself together, get dressed for my bub, as he always used to call me. We'd smoke, drink, and talk about all the cool shit that we'd do after the impending revolution, and how we'd get there, eventually. Mike is one of the kindest people I'll have ever met in my life. 
He always took everything I said seriously, even if it was a joke and I'd have to explain it to him so that he'd know that no one was in trouble. When I had to serve time, he visited me at RCCC unannounced. He couldn't come in because I had a visitor capacity limit. So when he was turned away at the front door, he sent me a bag of chocolates from my commissary. It's really a sweet thought, but it actually really stirs up a lot of trouble inside. So we laughed about that a lot after I got out. After all, he was the only guy I didn't take issue with crushing on me. He was genuinely, genuinely incredibly kind about it. Appropriately, after I learned this, we boxed each other and had David referee all night, wasting the night away in this great company that we're in today. Mike and Maida, David's sister and myself, um, flew to New York in February 2014 for a DSA conference. We were days late due to delay after delay. We spent Valentine's Day night together in 2014 in the Houston International Airport, which will forever be the most memorable and appreciated Valentine's night that I've ever spent in my life. They handed out hundreds of cots and we were lucky enough to snag a few of them. But Mike and I had other plans. Of course, we went off in search of unlocked liquor or a smoking patio. When we were unable to locate either of those things, we sock surfed the slick, expansive corridors until the sun came up. Only a few long days and nights later, navigating Brooklyn in the snow, Mike and I found ourselves eyeing the same person at the bar last night in New York. We fought about it all night while she and Meta observed. <laughs> Only a few hours later, we find ourselves in a stupor on the subway so that Meta would have to slap us both awake to make it to the airport in time to come back to California. You never know what memories you're going to keep, and we never know what's important in the moment or what we're going to remember years later. Irony glares in the face of our fallen comrade. While Mike wanted people to be free, the oppression of grief is disabling. It is my sincere belief that this world has been impacted in only the most dynamic and radical way because of Mike's work. This is one of those times in your life when we have to accept some changes. We have to decide to carry these people with us every day, if they become a part of us. I will carry a part of Mike's courage with me every day, and for that, I will be better and I'll fight harder. And that's Mike's legacy. Um, lastly, we're going to hear from Michael's aunt, Wynn. Um, she'll be reading letters from Maxime Barat Steve, and Steve Kerr, who are both currently in Rojava. Um, and then Andy will read a letter from Steve Kersnick, who was in Rojava but is now in Canada. Hi, I'm Wen. It's Wen with a W W I N Wen. Um, I was asked to read a, a couple of letters from a couple of Michael's comrades from Maxime Barat. I'll be very grateful if you can share this message during Michael's celebration. I was with Michael during a short time, but he will be in my heart until the end. I met him during his first travel in Rojava. We crossed the border together and were in the academy together. I discovered a person with a beautiful mind. We had deep conversation. I learned so much by being on his side. We got the project to go together during his second travel, but I was late, too late. The light in the dark, an angel has left this world. He will live in a lot of hearts. Sahid Namarin. And from Steve Kerr, Michael Israel, Robin Aguirre crossed the Tigris River with me in May 2015. We went to the academy together and stayed together for nearly five months. I shared a hall with him. I did guard duty with him. And we were never separated. I came to think of Michael as the son I never had. I will always remember his charismatic smile. He even laughed at my jokes, which, by the way, were not good. He will always be in my heart. I will remember him as a brother, a friend, 
Sahib Namaren Robin Aguirre. May you rest in peace. Hi, I'm Andy. I had the irreplaceable joy of serving for two years as co-chair of the Sacramento DSA with Michael. Um, and I have a message here from Steve Krosnick. Michael was a good person who had a pure soul with a big heart. Everyone who had the pleasure of meeting Michael was left with a piece of him. He lives in all of us now, and I hope we can all remember to carry that torch in his name as he would have carried it himself. To those who never had the chance to meet Michael, they are at a loss, but should they see how he lives in us, they will know Michael. His smile and his laugh I will always remember, lest we forget. Okay, that uh, concludes all of our speakers today, and uh, we will now move on to some music. Um, we're starting with International, so uh, I don't know if you've had a chance, but there are some really awesome zines back there, one of the tents next to the um, screen printing. Um, the red booklets have lyrics in them. Uh, the very front page is the lyrics to International, so if you could grab that so I'm not singing by myself, I would appreciate it. We'll give it 